and welcome to the Financial Wake Up Show. Each week, we explore and take a deep dive into awakening the financial abundance we all have inside of us. We educate and create awareness by focusing on fundamental principles of money, talking to business and community leaders about successful habits, while learning from each other how to build, protect, and create legacies. And now, here's your host, Daniel Choi. Good morning to you. It is a new day, and with each day comes a new beginning, a new chance to do something great, learn something new, and enjoy everything this great life has to offer. If you haven't already done so, go to iTunes or Google Play, subscribe to the podcast. You can download all our shows there. Also, subscribe to the show on YouTube. Find it under the Financial Wake Up Show with Daniel Choi. Want to give another quick shout out to Costa Mesa, California. I am picking up a lot of listens down there. So to those of you in that region of our Southern California area, thank you for your listenership. I'm broadcasting again on KCAA, the station that leaves no listener behind. I combine integrity and intelligence to wake you up to things you want to be doing financially. Check out our website, financialwakeupshow.com, or visit us on Facebook and Twitter. That's at TFWUS. If you have any doubt, just reach out. And on every show, we talk about three things. Number one, growing and protecting your wealth. Number two, exit planning, which is selling your business if you're a business owner or retirement if you're an employee. And finally, estate planning, which is creating a legacy while fully enjoying your money while you're alive. And I talk to a lot of people and that's where I get the topics for my show. And one of the things I always hear is, should I buy gold? Should I buy silver? What about real estate? What can, you know? Should I buy an apartment building? And what are commodities? And people are curious about these things called alternative invest, alternative investments or investments that are not necessarily stocks and bonds. So today's Wake Up Now segment is, what are the other types of investments I can purchase that I hear about in newspapers, from my friends, from my family, that I see in movies and in television? What are, what's the deal with these investments? So first thing to note, all investments carry risk. And so what I say today doesn't mean you should go buy these or you should sell these. It's general commentary designed to be educational and purpose. It's simple to say, but all investments do carry risk. And I think we take for granted what risk really is because there's different types of risk. Different investments have different types of risk. And I'm going to break all of these down based on the risk that they carry. It's not just saying, oh, it's risky or not risky. You have to know what kind of risk you're buying when you buy an investment. So here, let me cover some of the basic and major types of risk. The first is called speculative risk. That's simply the variability in an investment's rate of return. That seems to underlie a lot of investments out there, obviously. Rate of return is a big deal. I did a show last year on rate of return. If you haven't heard it, it's one of the more popular ones I did. Um, So check out that episode on iTunes or, or Google Play. But Uh, There's other risks we have to consider. The second type is called market risk. Market risk is risks that come from changes to inflation, to interest rates, to political, economic, demographic, social events and trends. So one of the things I always consider is when you invest in something, is there a regulated market to buy and sell those goods or those investments? Can you find buyers or brokers that will buy your investment so you can liquidate. Because if you don't have a market for your investment, it can be tough to cash out, right? Now there's also business risk, also called diversifiable risk. But this is a risk that may affect one company or an industry or a group of companies. That's called business risk. Another type of risk is called financial risk. This comes from the use of debt to finance a company. And there's financial risk involved there, which is, Closely related to credit risk. Just like we have credit reports, so do big companies. So credit risk is also called default risk, which means, hey, maybe contractually payments on the debt securities you're buying may not pay out. So like a junk bond is typically that of a company with bad credit, basically, or unproven credit. So you're taking more risk by buying junk bonds. Inflation risk. This is the risk that inflation will rise or fall and it will change the level of pricing but also may affect your net return. Uh, I talked about how inflation can eat away at compounding interest which is really powerful to think but inflation also compounds. Uh, Liquidity risk is the inability to sell. 
your asset quickly. So a lot of people say Legos have increased in value. Should I invest in Legos? In fact, I heard Legos over some period of time. I read an article how they've outperformed gold in some scenarios. Well, how quickly could you sell Legos? Where would you sell them? Is it on eBay? Is that regulated? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, political risk is things that happen because of trade disputes, wars, political unrest, tariffs, corruption, expropriation. Um, these are political things that have even affect the U.S. government uh, in recent months that we have to consider. Um, exchange rate risk. This is the risk that your currency that you're purchasing overseas drops in value. That's something that you really have to consider. Um, let's continue on with something called sovereign risk. Sovereign risk is the idea that a government may default on its jet debt just like a company would. Uh, there's also, lastly, but not leastly, tax risk. So what if taxation laws change? Income tax, estate tax, inheritance tax, gift taxation. These taxations can all cause major problems. So with regards to this risk, let's also consider that alternative investments tend to carry more risk than stocks and bonds because they represent a smaller market or have more volatile process, pricing and they can be sensitive. Whereas sometimes stocks and bonds have a regulated market, there's more history, more stability in these types of things. Uh, but I will say that alternative investments can be a very valuable part of your diverse portfolio. Why? Because they don't necessarily correlate to the stock and bond market. What correlation means is that when stock and bonds, the value in the markets drop, a correlated investment to stocks and bonds will also drop. But if they're not correlated, what will happen is they can go up, which means they can help balance out a portfolio because some alternative investments are not correlated at all to stocks and bonds. And that creates a nice diversification in case you see a market decline. So let's talk about some of these. The first one I mentioned, precious metals, gold, silver, platinum. These are the most common ones and they can be very volatile, I'll explain why. Let's go from the most volatile, excuse me, the least volatile to the most volatile. Gold is the least volatile, silver is a little bit more volatile, and platinum is the most volatile of all precious metals. So let's start with gold. It's unique because it's durable, it doesn't rust, it doesn't corrode, it's very malleable, and it can conduct both heat and electricity. While there are some industrial uses, mainly we know gold as a base for jewelry and also as a form of currency. The value of gold, uh, it's determined by a market 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, but it trades mostly as a function of sentiment. Its price is not as affected by things called supply and demand. Supply and demand drives most of the economy, but this is because there's a large amount of above ground hoarded gold than the number of gold mines out there where people are mining new gold. So because of this, Sentiment is the main driver of gold prices. So to put it simply, when hoarders feel like selling, the price drops. And when they want to buy, the, you know, the, the prices go up. Now, other factors that affect gold. When banks and money are perceived as unstable or there's a political instability, people tend to go to gold as a safe store of value. When rates of return in the equity bond or real estate markets are negative, people tend to go to gold because they think it'll maintain its value. So when you see a market decline, they go there. When there's a war or a political upheaval, people tend to go into gold hoarding mode, right? Because they, they feel unstable. Now let's move on to silver, okay? Now unlike gold, silver does have some sentiment, but it is more also a, an industrial metal, meaning it's used more. So industrial demand can drive the value of silver up besides its fact that it can store value. So it's kind of like gold because it is seen as a store of value, but then technology has a strong influence in, in price. For example, there's a, a, a very fast rise in the middle class in emerging market countries like in Asia. Why? Because electrical appliances, medical products, other industrial items that require silver are in demand. So it's driving silver up. It's also used a lot in batteries, superconductors, microcircuits. These things drive the value of silver up. So um, that's another consideration you have to make, but it is generally more volatile than gold. And then lastly, platinum. Platinum is also traded round the clock, uh, 
in commodities markets, uh, they get a higher price in gold because there's not much of it compared to gold. It's much rarer. Um, it is also used in technology, particularly in autos, because it helps reduce the, the harmful emissions. So that's a big deal. Um, petroleum chemical refining catalysts also uh, use platinum, as does the co computers use platinum sometimes. Um, so auto sales is a big driver sometimes of this. Clean air legislation is also big on platinum. The only problem really with platinum is that most of the mines are in South Africa and Russia. So sometimes you, you, you run into the risk that these two countries may control or even raise the prices of platinum. So when you're looking to buy precious metals like this, it's important to understand there's several ways to do it. You can use managed accounts like ETFs or exchange traded funds. Um, mutual funds and common stocks also trade in, in precious metals. You can buy something called futures and options, which are contracts that you can use to buy and, and make money on gold, um, depending on the price movement. And that's what futures and options are. I should do a show on futures and options in the future just to let you know. But uh, bullion is another place that people go. Bullion is the bricks or, you know, the gold coins and things like that. You know, those are mainly for investors who are thinking the worst. Now, imagine if for, for you to cash on a bullion, it's very illiquid. It's hard to store, by the way, you know, where are you going to keep this gold bullion? But the financial systems really have to crash. The banking and government systems have to fail. And even then, you know, if you're in a barter economy because everything's gone down, will bulk gold really mean anything? And that's the same with gold certificates. Certificates are where you, old, you own this bullion. You just don't store it. If, if the world goes down to, to, to the basement and everything is, uh, you know, the systems have all failed and we're back in, uh, you know, 300 years prior and everything's a disaster, who's going to take a certificate for your gold and say, oh, here's cash? Okay. So these are all the things you have to consider with precious metals. Now, there's also jewelry, art, wine, coins, collectibles, baseball cards, you name it. Anything that we consider what are called investments of passion. This is where the investor has a passion for, let's say, art. These investments are driven very much by either supply and demand, so like rarity, or a lot of emotional sentiment. So when you see a painting and it's worth $300,000, well, who's that worth $300,000 to? So... Uh, in fact, we're going to have a, a discussion on wine later on the show with our guest. But these investments of passion uh, are not generally regulated by markets. And you have to be very careful where you put this money because it can tend to be illiquid or lose value very quickly. For example, baseball cards, some of them uh, had a lot of value or, you know, before the year 2000. And a lot of those values have dropped in recent years. So you have to be aware of that. Um, emerging markets. What are emerging markets? These are foreign countries that are developing. And a lot of these are in Eastern Europe, Africa, the Middle East, Latin America. Uh, these countries are still growing. So there's a large potential for growth. But you run into different types of risks there. Foreign exchange risk I mentioned earlier. Uh, who knows who's regulating the businesses out there? Are they preventing insider trading? Are they you know, taking to the integrity of financial data? It's all very important to understand uh, that when you buy into merging nations, you can get a good return, but there's an appropriate risk to that as well. Um, a few others to talk about, commodities. Uh, this has been, you know, if you saw the moving back, back in the 80s, uh, trading places was about uh, commodities. Orange juice, pork bellies, oil, wheat, these are different goods. And what the basic concept here is that if I buy oil from one producer, it's the same oil as from this producer from the next. So. A barrel of oil is the same product. Now, the quality can vary a little bit, but the sale and purchase of commodities is done through futures contracts, and these commodities can go up and down. And so some people uh, actually use them to hedge. So, for example, wheat farmers often will buy future contracts around wheat so that they can hedge against a price drop in wheat during their harvest. Uh, but also some people speculate, so they want to see the prices go up and down. A few other things... Uh, Unit investment trusts or investment trusts, these are investment companies. One of the unique ones that are out there are called real estate investment trusts or REITs. REITs are a type of security that allow you to invest in properties or mortgages. They have some tax advantages, which people like, but it allows you to own things like 
hotels, apartment complexes, hospitals, office buildings by pooling people's money together. So for example, there, there's Timberland REITs, there's warehouse REITs, there's hotel REITs, things of that nature. There's some, uh, there are more income plays. There is a requirement that REITs pay out a dividend of 90%. So for people looking for income, they can be attractive, but there's some liquidity risk here. Some of them are publicly traded, which means you can get out of them. Some of them are not. So it may lock up your money for many, many years. So there's draw pros and cons to this type of situation. So the key here is to diversify. And if you have any interest in these types of investments, uh, it's important to not just diversify and be done with it. It's important to diversify and rebalance. Rebalance quarterly, monthly if you can. It's the foundation of modern portfolio theory, which I've covered in past shows and I should cover again maybe in the future. But both the concept of diversification with rebalance is very different than the alternative, which is to buy and hold investments. And buying and holding some of these investments can be a very big problem if you can't liquidate. Uh, it can also be a problem if you go solely into a, a, a very uh, volatile investment. So this week's Be Aware or Beware tip of the week is be aware of following media trends uh, into what might be hot. You know, gold, silver, it's all gone through the news in the past 10 years with the real estate crash of 07, 08. Uh, you know, it's uh, silver's been talked about lately in the last couple years. You know, many of the investments we talked about today are more volatile. However, if you pair those with the right portfolio, it can provide balance because some of these, again, are not correlated to the stock and bond markets. And also be aware that the more you buy individual holdings, for example, if you buy gold bullion or actual single bottles of wine, you're taking on more risk. If you buy professionally managed accounts, like separately managed accounts or ETFs or mutual funds that invest in these things, you can spread some of that risk out, reduce the volatility by essentially buying in bulk. You got to be aware of these things or be aware that you could be buying an investment based on the latest fad uh, and without proper rebalancing, you can end up with a negative asset on your books that could last for many years. The fix, talk to an advisor about how to include these investments in your portfolio. And if you have no one to talk to, talk to me. If you have any doubt, just reach out. We're going to take a quick break here. Uh, after we come back from break, we're going to have a great discussion around wine. So stay tuned for that. You're listening to the Financial Wake Up Show with Daniel Choi, KCAA, 1050 AM and 106.5 FM. I want to talk for a quick second about a unique internship program. I think a great internship program gives you a chance to make a name for yourself while picking up specialized skills that can launch your career. And if you can do that in a niche industry with a high level of importance that impacts how businesses operate, well then that's a win-win-win scenario. So I'm going to talk to you about Core Support Systems, a company that has an internship program for you listeners who want to get a foot in the door of a very important industry. For over 20 years, Core Support Systems has provided equipment for what are called mission-critical environments. They handle power requirements in case the power goes out. Who uses this? Hospitals. You can't have power go out during surgeries. How about computer server farms, these huge warehouses? You can't have power going out or the internet shuts down. This is big, big stuff we rely on. Core Support Systems delivers uninterruptible power supplies to these huge operations that need this in case of any mission critical or outage situation. They also do centralized emergency lighting, design and assessment of your power distribution needs. They do precision cooling for all your businesses as well. They install and support these systems. I know the owners there, Hector and Irene, they are fantastic. They have a great team and have built an unbelievable business. They are looking for a business development intern who will help secure contracts for key accounts. You'll be expected to learn about product and service offerings, which will add to your ability to increase sales revenues and your personal business income. Core Support Systems is moving forward to a virtual office, so you're gonna be primarily working from home. You do need a high level of computer literacy, especially with uh, Word, Excel, and PowerPoint being some of the key softwares you need to know. Uh, but if you're goal-oriented, customer-oriented, you're reliable, you've got a positive attitude, great attendance record, and you're a team player, take a look at the internship being offered at Core Support Systems. For inquiries, email ialvarado at coresupportsys.com. That's ialvarado at coresupportsys.com. Or you can call them toll-free, 800-780-2673 extension 4453. All 
right, welcome back to the show. And at this point, I'm going to bring on our first guest. We talked today about alternative alternative investments, including investments of passion. And one of those passions I have, as many of you listeners do, is for wine. So I thought, what better than to have uh, a very special guest on the show today to tell us about wine and some of the intricate details of how we should be enjoying and buying it. Our guest today is Amy Mulally, who's the North American wine buyer and producer of content, seminars, and tastings for The Wine Country, which is the largest independent and family-owned wine shop in Southern Los Angeles for the last 22 years. She is a certified sommelier from the Court of Master Sommeliers. She's a certified advanced sommelier with honors distinction from the Wine and Spirits Education Trust. She has a certification of viticulture and enology from UC Davis. Uh, she was also part of the Navarro Winery and Vineyards production, educations, and sales team. Uh, she's been a wine director and buyer uh, in previous years as well. She's also judged wines at several large competitions, international ones, in fact. And she's an independent consultant as well. So I think she's, she's a great person to answer some of these questions. First, I want to welcome you to the show. Amy, how are you this morning? I'm great, Daniel. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this should be a lot of fun. And and so first off, you know, the wine industry itself, how do you get into that? And tell us about your, your career path to date. Sure. So my path started uh, around uh, the year 2000. I was living in the southeast and um, ended up working while in law school at a little French bistro and got the wine bug, as they say. Um, all it takes is a couple sips of something beautiful and you kind of get hooked. With that, I uh, ended up making the plan, just got to get to California, of course, where it's all going on. And within the year of graduating from law school, moved out to Northern California and never looked back. <laughs> yes, and I, too, admittedly have the bug uh, that you are talking about. Um, so I'm very curious about a few things. Uh, the first thing is, you know, from what I know, wine is a huge universe of different types different regions around the world. Let's start with the basics. What's the best way to taste and develop a palate for wine? Well, the most important thing I tell my beginning customers and students that really want to delve in is to figure out what you like. Um, what we know most in our area of the world are kind of the big three, as I call it, we have Cabernet Sauvignon, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir. Those are kind of the most popular grape varieties and, and uh, makes up a pretty big portion of what we do out here in California at the moment. So that's a great place to start. Um, and beyond that, you, the world just gets um, increasingly more complicated and more exciting. I like to think of it as um, a color wheel. When you have the primary colors, there's red, yellow, and blue and get a good handle on that. But then if you look at the secondary level of the oranges and the purples and go on from there. Um, so my thought um, for most people starting is get a good handle on those primary grapes. Um, one of the great books that I, that I tell folks to start with if they really want to do a little reading as well as tasting would be the Kevin Zraeli, Windows on the World. Um, it's a great introductory book to just really lay out the different basic grape types, what their characteristics are, and what the taste profiles are, and helps them get a little handle on how to appreciate them and then be able to move on from there. Sure, that's, that's exciting, and uh, listeners take note of that book. I might have to pick that one up as well. I, I have a favorite. It's, a, it's Cabernet, but I do enjoy tasting white wines and champagnes as well. Um, tell me a little bit about how to taste. Is there a different way to taste white wines and red wines and champagnes? Or, you know, because I know some people can identify different fruits and things like that. How, how do you do that? Yes, and there, there is. There's um, what we use um, in the industry, and especially as we're studying and trying to really effectively analyze wines um, without having bias in play, is a deductive method. Um, and it's a very important skill to develop, and you would use that whether you're tasting a red wine, a white wine, um, a champagne, a rosé, and um, there's a lot of good resources. Um, that Kevin's Rayleigh really book will kind of go into a basic format of it, um, and just kind of helps you assess, you know, both by sight, by 
nose, by the smell, and by the taste. And you kind of go through a very deductive um, style of reasoning to just assess, you know, the quality of the wine and be able to pick out the different natures of fruits and floral components and the winemaking components as well. Is there, you know, has this wine seen oak or not? Um, and that applies all the way across the board. Um, with that said, you are looking for very different things um, depending on the, the type of wine that you're tasting. And that's where just a basic study program of learning some typicity of the different grapes helps a lot. Um, for example, you are very much into the Cabernet Sauvignon. So you kind of have a good idea of what a good Cabernet Sauvignon will taste like. You know, what are our fruit characteristics? We have traditional black currant, blackberry, we have graphite, we have leather, we have smoke. Um, we have some oak components, we have um, some dark peppery notes. And from there, you can, when you taste different Cabernets, you can kind of, you know, get a sense of, hey, is this, you know, fall in the realm? And, and so that's a great way to, to taste. And each grape has its own set of characters that are innate to the grape itself that would help, you know, define for you, hey, is this a good one? And that's a great learning tool. You know, I uh, talk to people, you know, offhand quite a bit, and sometimes the idea of building a wine collection can be uh, a topic. And to me, that seems like a pretty daunting task. I mean, where do you start yes. if you want to, you know, I've seen these little, um, the, what do you call them, the wine coolers and, and, and different storage mm -hmm. units you can buy, but how do you start building a personal wine collection? You know, that's um, pretty much relates back to, I, I strongly encourage people to really find out what they like first and go from there. I, I can't tell you how many customers I see that they, you know, kind of got the wine bug and they said, oh, well, I'm going to collect. And so they collect, you know, what's collectible, maybe the Cabernet Sauvignon, for example, and they end up with this giant cellar space full of Cabernet Sauvignon. Well, you have to start thinking, well, how often do I drink Cabernet Sauvignon, the beautiful grape, and a very intense dark red wine. So, you know, unless you're having steak every single night, um, you start to see, well, gosh, I need a little more variety in my cellar. And I think that's the biggest mistake that I see. Unless you're purely looking to build a cellar for investment purposes, um, you know, in which then it's the value of the bottles and you're going to resell and it's not as much about enjoying the wines that you have. I just strongly encourage people to think about, you know, having diversity and just start with what you like and pick up a little bit of each and uh, go from there. In fact, you know, kind of starting with maybe a, a 25 or a 50 bottle unit as they sell would be a good way because the other thing that happens is it's a lot to manage. Um, ideally, if you're going to build a cellar, you don't want to lose track of anything in there, which if you talk to anyone, it happens all the time. <laughs> so ideally, you want to create a spreadsheet, um, whatever you're comfortable using, a good one, cellar tracker. I know a lot of folks also just use a simple Excel, and you can kind of start logging in each wine that you purchase and try to keep track of what you've got. So I just say start small <laughs> so you can personally manage it. Uh, of course, there are folks that can manage it for you, but that's, I think that's part of the fun. You brought up a couple of points I want to ask a few more questions about. Um, I enjoy hosting parties and dinners and things like that just for fun. And outside of the typical, you know, dark wine, red wine goes with meat, you know, lighter red wines with chicken and white wine with fish. What are some other pairing considerations that you like to consider when you're looking at pairing wine with food? Sure, that's a good one, and that that's a that's a maybe one of the most challenging topics because I think we can kind of make a set of rules that, that generally make sense, but there's always anomalies, um, and some of the most exciting pairings that you'll find kind of defy logic. So it's about trial and error and keeping it you know open. But with that said, um, I you know I like your your rule with the you know heavier reds with the heavier meats and and so on. But I always like to point out uh, you you visit a place um, you know Sicily for example, and it's a very fish based diet, and yet they're drinking red wine with the fish. Right. So I always like to just say hey keep an open mind. Another thing um, you can do is try to match textures and complexity. If you're having a very complicated dish with a lot of layers and a lot of 
bold flavors, you might think about matching your wine in that way mm. to, you know, more intense, more structured, more layers in the wine as well. Another few um, little pointers, though, that I often like to share with folks that they don't realize, um, and one is spice. If you've got a lot of spice in your food, you want to be really careful about pairing it with wines that have a lot of tannin. Um, and for those of you who don't know tannin, that's the drying, gripping um, sensation that, especially in Cabernet Sauvignon, it comes from both the oak barrels and also the skins and seeds of the grape. And different grapes have uh, more presence of tannins than others, Cabernet being one of the heavier. So you just, you know, if you've got a real spicy dish, you want to think about a wine with less tannin. So something really soft, maybe like a Pinot Noir has low tannins uh, by nature. If it's a really bold meat that's, um, you know, heavily seasoned, you could think about like a Zinfandel. That's also a softer tannin grape. So that's just something that um, will help the pairings immensely. Because, you know, honestly, what usually suffers when you have a bad food and wine combination is the wine. The food will be fine, but the wine <laughs> gets thrown under the bus, so to speak. Yeah. Um, another one um, that I like to point out is the sweetness level. It's something that seems to be very you know, misunderstood. And again, it's the wine that gets kind of thrown under the bus. So I always like to tell folks whatever the sweetness level is in your dish you've got to at least match that if not exceed it in the wine for example you know people say oh my gosh special occasion we're going to have you know wine and chocolate well very very challenging the chocolate's going to be fine but the wine is going to suffer so if you're going to have chocolate you got to be thinking about something at least at the level of like a port to match it that's a uh, really good stuff and I might have been killing some of the uh, dishes I've been preparing with, because I tend to uh, prefer the spicier, you know, tannin stuff, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I've got to think about it. That's very good. Now, a couple few uh, more questions. Um, some of these bottles I've seen sell for like $3,000 or $1,000. <laughs> I mean, just really, really pricey, and I'm not even yeah. talking at the restaurant. I'm talking at the store, so are these right. wines worth it, and, and what makes them so expensive, and how do you... You know, how do you determine that value? Yeah, that's a great question. There's a couple different things going on. Um, I was just up in Oakville um, last week for the Vintners Association tasting, and we got to taste the annual vintage. And so with Screaming Eagle, for example, some of you may know that is a wine that has skyrocketed in value since its inception. Um, it sells for, you know, an exorbitant amount of money. And, you know, hey, the question, is that worth it? Well, I taste it. It's a beautiful wine, seamless wine. Now, is it worth it? You know, market and demand has driven that wine to be the cost that it is. And what I tell my customers is if you can afford it and that means um, that much to you, then yes, it's worth it. But for someone that, you know, wow, you've got to, you know, take a second mortgage out to buy a bottle of Screaming Eagle, well, then no. Uh, <laughs> So I say it's all relative, you know, um, you don't have to spend that much money for a great bottle of wine. And a lot of times as it, with an example like that, it becomes that valued because of the trend and the market demand. But uh, at the same time, another area that's interesting is, is talk about Grand Cru Burgundy. I mean, this is a wine that's priced uh, the most expensive in the world. But it's because of the extremely limited availability of it. Um, there's only a few vineyard sites and only a few bottles of wine, especially in the recent vintages with the weather challenges in Burgundy that come out. So then you think, okay, now I understand why this wine is priced the way it is. And again, I, I kind of say the same thing. You know, if you can afford it and that fits in your budget, there you know, can be some of the most beautiful wines in the world and certainly worth trying. I think you have to think about um, what you value your experience um, versus your pocketbook. And, and that's kind of where it leads you. Yeah. Do not take a second mortgage to buy wine. Right. That's just, you know, on the theme of what I tell people. Yeah. Uh, what, are you, what are the top three things you're drinking right now? What, what's, uh, what, are, what are your favorites and uh, suggestions? Definitely. There's a couple of things. First of all, rosé is really hot right now, and we're so excited to finally see that. I think there was a misconception for many years about 
what rosé is and isn't. Um, we had a, a big era in our wine culture that kind of, um, you know, <laughs> bastardized the concept of rosé a bit. So what we're seeing now, luckily, is this great resurgence of appreciation for this just delightful, quaffable, perfect for the weather that we have. And they're bone dry. Uh, they have elements of a red wine with the texture and the weight, and yet they're refreshing, served cold. Um, and just the other key thing with rosé, and I do this when I was running restaurant, is if you've got a bunch of different dishes, um, maybe you're sitting in a restaurant with everyone ordering something completely different, or it is at home in a party and you're serving a bunch of different things, rosé can be that bridge that pairs well with everything. So just a, a thought for those who are still on the fence and still not willing, it's just uh, definitely worth trying and it's, and it's a great versatile wine and you know the wines coming, this is basically um, the southern French region, the Provence region, they're all just bright and crisp and fresh and delightful. So that's a, that's a definitely hot topic. If folks haven't checked it out, they should. The other thing I'll say is that there's a couple areas of the world that are really have been suffering the past um, vintage with weather. Chablis is one of them. It's one of the most undervalued areas that we have right now. So it's a good time to buy Chablis. It'll age. The upper level crews will age. Um, they're enjoyable right now. And it's just a really underappreciated category. So that's definitely something to look into. Um, probably my third favorite. Um, it's probably going to be just the kind of uh, Pinot Noirs that are coming out of Oregon right now. The Willamette Valley just had a really, really amazing series of vintages, and that's challenging for them usually. They usually have some weather issues as far north as they are. So the past couple of vintages, the 14s, 15s, and it will be the 16s as well, it's a great time to you know, dive into the Willamette Pinot Noirs if you haven't experienced those. Well, fantastic. Those are some... You're making me want to have a glass of wine right now. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, just the description. Now, you do consultations, you do tastings, you also, um, you know, provide a lot of different services. How do our listeners get a hold of you, your business, and 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 what's the best way? Sure. So um, we are the wine country, and we're right. It's technically Signal Hill in Long Beach, so right off the four hundred five off of Redondo Avenue, and um, you can reach us. It's five six two. 597-8303 and we're on the web at thewinecountry.com and that's got a listing of our calendar and we do tastings every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Fridays are our evening seminars where it's kind of more of a formal presentation. We pour really high-end wines and the topics change each week so check out our website to see what's going on and you can reach me there. Awesome. Awesome. Amy. I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you very much for joining the Financial Wake Up Show. Thank you for having me, Daniel. All right, let's take a quick break, and uh, we'll be right back after this word from our sponsors. I want to talk for a quick second about a unique internship program. I think a great internship program gives you a chance to make a name for yourself while picking up specialized skills that can launch your career. And if you can do that in a niche industry with a high level of importance that impacts how businesses operate, well then that's a win-win-win scenario. So I'm going to talk to you about Core Support Systems, a company that has an internship program for you listeners who want to get a foot in the door of a very important industry. For over 20 years, Core Support Systems has provided equipment for what are called mission critical environments. They handle power requirements in case the power goes out. Who uses this? Hospitals. You can't have power go out during surgeries. How about computer server farms, these huge warehouses? You can't have power going out or the internet shuts down. This is big, big stuff we rely on. Core Support Systems delivers uninterruptible power supplies to these huge operations that need this in case of any mission critical or outage situation. They also do centralized emergency lighting, design and assessment of your power distribution needs, 
They do precision cooling for all your businesses as well. They install and support these systems. I know the owners there, Hector and Irene, they are fantastic. They have a great team and have built an unbelievable business. They are looking for a business development intern who will help secure contracts for key accounts. You'll be expected to learn about product and service offerings, which will add to your ability to increase sales revenues and your personal business income. Core Support Systems is moving forward to a virtual office, so you're gonna be primarily working from home. You do need a high level of computer literacy, especially with uh, Word, Excel, and PowerPoint being some of the key softwares you need to know. Uh, but if you're goal-oriented, customer-oriented, you're reliable, you've got a positive attitude, great attendance record, and you're a team player, take a look at the internship being offered at Core Support Systems. For inquiries, email ialvarado at coresupportsys.com. That's ialvarado at coresupportsys.com, or you can call them toll free, 800-780-2673, extension 4453. Okay, and we're back from that quick word from our sponsors. And as you know, every week, I love to highlight nonprofits to end the show. Why? Because I don't think you can get more in life without giving more. So on this week's Give More to Get More segment, I want to welcome Rajesh Anandan, who is an entrepreneur, entrepreneur, a growth architect, who is very passionate about his purpose as a motivator and neurodiversity as a competitive advantage. He is the co-creator of UNICEF Kid Power, the world's first wearable for good, and is co-founder of Ultra Testing, a neurodiverse technology company employing individuals on the autism spectrum which as you listeners know is something that is near and dear to my heart. Rajesh began his career at Microsoft as a program manager and then joined Bain and Company where he focused on business incubation and growth strategy for technology, media, financial services, healthcare, and retail clients. For the past 10 years, he's worked on the impact sector, including setting up and running the private sector division at the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria as well as launching and scaling up UNICEF ventures at the U.S. Fund for UNICEF. Uh, he has a, BS, a BSc and ME in Computer Science and Electrical Engineering from MIT with concentrations in Artificial Intelligence, Systems Dynamics, and Economics. Rajesh, we are excited to have you on the show this morning. How are you today? I'm fine, thanks, Daniel. Thanks so much for having me. And that's a long bio. It's, uh, it must mean I'm, <laughs> I'm getting too old to be on radio. No, no, not at all. Uh, we like long bios here, and uh, certainly your career and the work you've done so far is not just uh, innovative, but it's really impacting some important areas. Let's start at 30,000 feet. What, what is the overall mission for UNICEF Kid Power? Uh, well, so UNICEF Kid Power uh, is a program of uh, UNICEF in the U.S., and we work to save and protect the world's most vulnerable children. Uh, UNICEF itself is a global organization. We're in 190 countries and territories around the world, and we work every day with colleagues uh, from you know New York City to uh, South Sudan, making sure that every child has a chance to survive and thrive. And, in that context, um, UNICEF Kid Power is looking to solve two global crises, one um, that affects children here in the U.S., and uh, it's something that I care about deeply as a parent, where one in four American kids is uh, completely inactive, and that has lots of health uh, consequences and, and really puts their future at risk, and meanwhile, one in four children globally is malnourished, and the worst case scenario of malnourishment is severe acute malnutrition, which unless treated immediately can put children's life at risk. And, you know, both of these challenges have been getting worse over the decades, and to be frank, us grown-ups have failed to solve either one. And so as UNICEF, we uh, did what we tend to usually do, which is put our faith in kids. And so Kid Power inspires kids to tap into their inner heroes and help end global malnutrition one step at a time by getting active themselves. And we've built a technology, the Kid Power Band, and, and an app experience that we'd like to believe is the world's first wearable for good that 
gets kids active and connects that activity to having impact around the world. Yeah, tell us about this wearable because I know when my staff was researching your organization, that came up as something I've never heard of. But uh, tell us about this technology and what it does and how it's driving your cause. Sure. So um, we have a kid power band. It's a uh, wrist-worn fitness band that measures movement and steps. It's got an accelerometer, a pedometer. It's designed especially for kids. It's durable. It's water resistant. Um, and it's safe in terms of protecting data and privacy of kids. We're UNICEF. We're <laughs> thinking about these things. And so what it does is as kids wear our kid power band and get active, they earn kid power points. Every 2,400 steps they take, they earn a point. When they earn a point, there's a little celebration that happens on their wrist. The band vibrates. It gives them sort of this haptic feedback and scrolls a really positive, encouraging message that says, you're great, you're awesome, keep going. Because every 10 points they earn unlocks funding for a packet of ready-to-use therapeutic food that UNICEF delivers to a severely malnourished child somewhere in the world. And so the more children move, the more points they earn, the more children they help and more lives they save. And what we're really doing is giving kids the chance to save lives. We're tapping into a desire that all kids have to feel like they matter, you know, to feel like what, what they do is of significance. Like they can literally change the world because, of course, we believe they can and we just need to get out of the way and give them the chance to do it. Sure. And it also tackles that first problem you mentioned, which is some of the inactivity of children in our country. Um, so it's, it's got two amazing benefits there. I think that's, that's brilliant. Now, if you could tell our listeners, uh, you, you provide food packets to under or malnourished children. Can you tell us a little bit about the areas specifically that UNICEF Kid Power is providing support and who they target in terms of the support? Yeah, sure. So uh, severe acute malnutrition uh, is not hunger, um, and hunger is, is a tough condition, uh, uh, but severe acute malnutrition is a medical condition that requires urgent treatment, and it only happens, unfortunately, in the poorest, hardest-to-reach communities in the poorest parts of the world. Um, and so it's places like Burkina Faso, some parts of Haiti, uh, South Sudan, etc., where uh, there's about 30 countries, and really it's not even a country, it's the poorest communities in those countries where we find severe acute malnutrition. It affects about 16 million children around the world, uh, and every year, unfortunately, we lose a million young lives because of it, directly because of it, and the treatment is simple, it's cost-effective, we know it works. It comes in the form of these ready-to-use therapeutic fa food packets that UNICEF can deliver to anywhere in the world in a very short time period. And our, uh, our, our primary constraint is a lack of funding. And so we wanted to tap into a different uh, type of funding by building these really exciting wearable products and, and uh, digital experiences that kids will love and want to engage in and built into the price of that. So when you buy a kid power band online at unicefkidpower.org or at any Target store around the nation, um, let's say you buy for $39.99, $10 of that is set aside as the impact fund. And some kids are more active, some kids are less, but as kids get active and earn points, they're unlocking that money from that pool of funding uh, that we then uh, get to UNICEF's procurement division who buy and distribute the therapeutic food packets. And to date, UNICEF has been able to deliver full courses of therapeutic food treatment to over 40,000 severely malnourished children. And those children quite literally may not have survived if not for the energy and enthusiasm and, and active um, contribution of all the kids who are participating in Kid Power. And at this point, we have over 250,000 
children getting active around the country um, through with their families at home and also through schools. We're in something like 6,000 classrooms in over 1,600 cities and towns in 49 states around the country. Don't ask me why we're not in 50 states. Um, but it, it's really a national movement, and it's incredible to see the excitement that kids have knowing that what they do can literally save another child's life. It's, it's remarkable. First of all, the statistic you mentioned earlier, over a million young lives being lost to this malnutrition, and the fact that your program has already assisted 40,000 um, those are some astounding numbers, and this is really something I think could be valuable to introduce to some of the schools here locally in Southern California, Orange County, and LA County. Um, what areas can our listeners help and get involved with your programs and, and expanding on this, this cause? Yeah, well, so first, there are already 25,000 third, fourth, fifth grade students in the LA region who are participating in Kid Power right now. They're literally getting active to save lives um, day in and day out with Kid Power. The 25,000 uh, LA kids are already doing this, and together they have unlocked, just this school year since the spring, over a quarter of a million therapeutic food packets. Think about that. These kids in LA are helping children around the world. Um, and so for your audience, uh, there's a couple ways to get involved. Today, uh, on Saturday the 13th, we're having our first big Kid Power Day. Um, it's an event at LA Live from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. The event's going to be really fun. There'll be a Target crazy maze. Uh, there'll be a station where you can learn how to train like a Jedi. Um, and that's made possible by our Kid Power presenting sponsors, Target and, and Lucasfilm and Star Wars Force for Change. Um, we'll have some of our... Uh, famous athlete champion, uh, as well as some Star Wars characters. Chewbacca will be there, R2-D2 will be there. Um, you've got to come check it out at LA Live today from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. And then for those who can't make it, uh, you can download our Kid Power app uh, on the App Store or Google Play and go on a mission. If you're not a kid and you're a grown-up, you don't have to buy a Kid Power band. You can just literally use your phone, and while you're walking around town, I know it's LA, there's not a lot of walking, but as you're moving around, you'll literally be saving lives. Wow. And now, now that you brought up Jedi, I am completely sold on getting involved for sure. I'm a big Star Wars fan on the side, but that's that sounds like a lot of fun for, for all of you. Again, that's 11 to 4 p.m. today at LA Live. If you and your kids don't have anything, or if you yourself don't have anything planned, head on down there, and it sounds like they have a lot of fun activities set up. Uh, what's the best way, Rajesh, for our listeners to get in, in touch? Is it the app or is there a website that you recommend they, they go to? What's the best way they can connect with your organization? Yeah, so um, unicefkidpower.org uh, is the best place to go. You can buy a band from there. You can figure out how to download an app. You can download the Kid Power app directly, Unicef Kid Power, again, from the uh, Apple App Store or Google Play. Um, and then you can find out more about the other work that UNICEF does around the world at unicefusa.org. Fantastic. Last question, Rajesh. What's been the most rewarding aspect of your involvement with UNICEF Kid Power? It's uh, really every time we hear from uh, a, a child who's joined Kid Power and is starting to feel the literal power they have to change the world for the better. It's really inspiring. I mean, we hear from kids all the time, with, from parents, from principals. We heard from an eight-year-old uh, in uh, California who had started insisting that her mom take her for walks in the park every day after school. We heard from a bunch of third graders who had started a pickup game of uh, soccer at recess every day uh, so they could earn more points and unlock more packets. Uh, we heard from a school uh, in Boston where the kids themselves had just started a walking club so they could earn more points and unlock more packets. Um, you know, it's, it's really, really uh, inspiring to see how creative kids can get when they have a reason to get active. And 
they will figure it out. And, and we really believe that we're inspiring an entire generation of American kids to grow up active and healthy and also believing that they can change the world around them for the better. That is just a very beautiful story to uh, start our weekend off. And I appreciate your time this morning. Again, unicefkidpower.org. They have that great event at LA Live today. Go check them out. Rajesh, uh, I want to thank you very much for spending your morning with us today. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you, Daniel. Happy Saturday. Yes, to you as well. Okay, so action-packed radio show today. A lot of good information. Reach out to me, Daniel, at financialwakeupshow.com. Call me, 8507-WAKE-UP. You can also check out the website, financialwakeupshow.com. I had a great time today. You've been listening to the Financial Wake Up Show with Daniel Choi. Until next Saturday, I wish you health, wealth, and prosperity. Godspeed.